All right. So here we we set that up, and then you know we are all ready to run the simulation. So the nice thing about this methodology is, if you are able to get that for say one case, then what you can do is let me just open up a case that you guys would find more interesting. Okay. So this right here is a virtual wind tunnel. All right. The the wind tunnel is kind of shaped weirdly because this is something that was, that that I set up in the last and last minute. So this is not a super accurate simulation, but this kind of gives you a lot of basics. So this right here is a virtual wind tunnel, and sitting inside that is a. I hope some of you can recognize this. Can anyone tell me what is this? What type of a vehicle this is? It's actually a FSAE car, right? It's not the F1 car, but this is an FSAE car. So, <clears throat> so this right here is a virtual wind tunnel setup. So if you're doing something like this, and if you really don't have time to learn CFD, what are some things you need to make sure that you don't miss? Well, the first thing is you need to get you need to position your uh, vehicle correctly this has been positioned incorrectly meaning the upstream and downstream distances are really really small the upstream distance should be at least that depends upon the experiments the downstream distance should be at least 10 times the length of the length of the car which clearly in this case is not but for demonstration purposes this is fine similarly from the top view this thickness or this width is really small usually this should be at least 10 times the size of the width of the a uh, car which clearly in this case is not but as i mentioned this is purely for demonstration point of view but then all the software setup the simulation setup is pretty much the same right so in this case i ran the simulation uh, and i ran it very coarse and this is how the results are going to look like right so for example this is the post processed result maybe i'll use a black background so that you can see what's going going on a little bit more clearly okay so this is the fsa car and note that i'm coloring everything by velocity right so for example you can see that wherever the tire is present there is low velocity region so that typically means that's a high pressure region and consequently if i color this say f1 car with uh, pressure that's going to take a little bit of time and then what i can do is uh, maybe color this guy with uh, or just change the labels it's not the labels but the, the legends change the color a little bit there we go so now the car is colored by pressure all right i'll i'll just hide the other things so that it doesn't cause a lot of confusion so the wing for example is colored by the pressure and this is a classic uh, picture that shows down force and if you see the bottom side of the wing that is colored by pressure as well so what you can learn from this particular image is the concept of down force you have higher pressure on top and lower pressure this means visually or qualitatively this result makes sense similarly what are the other high pressure zones like if you look at your front wing see that there is high pressure on the top and low pressure in the bottom so in your wing you are generating some down force the front wing you are generating some down force that makes sense but in this case since it's fsa the end plate configuration is not great though there is some amount of deviation so if i put this car uh, in the front view right so you can see that there is some amount of uh, if i use the red color there is some amount of deviation in this direction it's not a lot but there is a little bit of deviation ideally if you try to kind of channel your air flow like this then that can be very good for the uh, aerodynamic performance but again would i trust this result to be honest not really uh, this was actually run with a lot of cells so i think i ran it with around 0.5 million cells but like i said any results that you're getting that is less than 20 million cells the answers are probably wrong right so let's actually take a look at the computational mesh so for example here we have the computational mesh and the technique that i'm using here if i just enable it here is what you call as adaptive mesh refinement so let's hide the stream tracer maybe hide the plane and if we put that put this in the front view this is called as adaptive mesh refinement what's happening is let's say we hide the grid so this is actually your velocity distribution in this cut plane now what's happening is wherever there is a large gradients in the solution right so which typically happens when flow encounters an obstacle right there's going to be large gradients and uh, to be very specific it's actually not gradients but it's actually curvature change so that's what you call as second order derivative in velocity or temperature that can trigger the adaptive mesh refinement 
and the solver is automatically adding more cells in areas where it requires. So the nice thing is you don't have to guess. You don't have to guess where the computational mesh should be refined. The solver is doing it automatically, which is much more consistent because if you're doing it manually, you will definitely not be able to predict how big the wake is. So in the same example, you know, for example, if I rotate the model like this and change the plane like this, look at that. That looks pretty interesting, right? Your wake, your wake region is pretty big and the solver is kind of automatically refining it. The problem is this refinement is still not enough. Your simulation results are still not going to be that accurate. But this gives you a very, this is what you call as a baseline result. Meaning with a baseline result, you know that your simulation is running. So the only thing that you need to do is increase the computational measure resolution. Thank you.